Hi, everybody back in Venlo. Okay. I made this picture when I was working in South Sudan for an organization called Doctors Without Borders. Today I'd like to tell you about a man I met during my time there and how it brought me here. The man's name was Stephen and he was working as a handyman in a hospital I was assigned to. Together, we erected a new clinic, we fixed the fences around the hospital and took care of all the water problems in the village. One day after work, Stephen introduced me to his wife and five daughters, and I told him he was a very lucky man. He then questioned how lucky he was with all these women telling him what to do all the time, but I could see he loved them very much. One, after a couple of weeks, when most of the work was done, and I had to go to the next hospital, we said our goodbyes, and I promised to return a month later to see how things were going. Several weeks passed with relative calm until we got a disturbing message. There had been an attack. People had died and fires had broken out, but the full extent of the tragedy wasn't clear to me until I got flown in the next day to assess the damages. Large parts of the hospital were burnt, and there were people scattered everywhere being treated of gunshot and knife wounds just out in the open. I quickly set out to find Stephen, and as we walked through the village, I noticed that only half the huts in the village were burnt. I asked my translator why this was, and he explained to me that the attackers had only burnt the huts that still had people in them. They had only burnt the huts that still had people in them. I eventually found Stephen in a hut in the back of the village. He was, he was physically present, but any joy in his eyes was gone. They, they were just empty. I learned that he had been out gathering firewood when the attack had happened. His wife and daughters, however, had been at home and were burnt in their houses. Stephen's story doesn't stand alone. And it's representative of the kind of violence that drives people to become refugees and flee their homes. The 2016 UNHCR Annual Global Trends Report puts the number of people forcibly displaced from their homes at a staggering 65.3 million, compared to 37.5 only a decade ago. Globally, one in every 113 humans is now displaced from their homes by conflict or persecution. For me, every one of these people could be Stephen. I'm Dick Klassen, and I'm part of a group of engineers that has created a new symbiosis. We use the engineering knowledge our business venture generates to provide aid to refugees in camps around the world. We call ourselves CELOS, which in Native American culture means transformer, and was a powerful being that came through the original world and made it livable for the people. To achieve this purpose, we have developed a new technology a way of monitoring, aiding, and improving life in refugee camps by networking a system of sensors. With this network, refugees can receive help from experts, last a lot longer on scarce resources, and offer all of its inhabitants humane living conditions. And it all starts with this little box. This box can connect to almost any sensor, it can give its location. It can control other machines. It can store information. It can last on a single battery charge for years. And it can send messages and alarms. We are working as hard and fast as possible to bring our idea to the world. But we are only a collective of six people trying to change a global problem that has been around for millennia. 
there, there have been countless initiatives that have tried and failed to make a difference because they thought having an idea alone would be enough. This, in fact, is only the beginning. And we want to make all of you part of the solution because we can only influence problems on this scale if we do it together. But first, let me elaborate on our idea. What if we could solve almost any problem in any refugee camp and it would all start with this little box? Eight organizations buy vaccines to inoculate people against various diseases. These vaccines have to be kept cold so that they won't spoil. Now imagine our little box, or node as we call it, being connected to a temperature sensor. We'd then place it in the vaccine fridge where it would detect a temperature increase and send a message. This message would go from our node to a receiver and from the receiver to the internet. On the internet, we have built a piece of software that can show the temperature increase on a website or send an alarm via text message or email. On this website, a vaccine expert could be monitoring all the fridges in that country. Or the text message could go to the cell phone of a local doctor that could transfer the vaccines before they get too hot. We could build a node with a button on it and give it to women so that before they get attacked at night in these camps, they can use the network to alert help. Children go lost in these camps daily and are at risk of falling prey to human traffickers. We could make a necklace node and use its GPS to find them. We could use our node to monitor chlorine levels in drinking water and this way prevent a lot of diarrheal diseases. These diseases alone are responsible for killing around 760,000 children under five yearly. However, we are not a subsidized aid organization. Like you, we are regular people that need a regular job to pay the bills. This being said, we refuse to close our eyes. We believe that our knowledge and skills have to be used to help people that lack even the most basic human needs. This is why we have chosen to create a new path. We call it symbiotic entrepreneurship. And that might sound expensive, but it's just about having two different objectives for your company and making sure that in execution they end up strengthening each other. For us, this means a commercial side that will only enter into partnerships and projects that can be beneficial to our humanitarian work. And a humanitarian side that allows us to field test our products and improve their quality beyond anything our competitors have to offer. But, as I've said, an idea alone is not enough. We need a third side to strengthen our venture. And that's all of you. After today, you will be able to directly improve the living conditions for refugees. At this point, some of you might be wondering, what can I do? Well, don't underestimate the power of the crowd. For instance, do you have technical knowledge? Come, help us improve. Do you know anything about logistics or water? Please become one of our advisors. Even if you just go to the site, like us on social media, or share our story, you will bring our movement one step closer to making sure every refugee can live in humane conditions. What site, you ask? Well, I would like all of you here today to be witness to the launch of our new crowd portal. 
I'm going to use this node to send a message that will put the site live. After that, there's a countdown is going to start, and I would like all of you to join me as we count down from five to one and launch the next step in our evolution. So here we go. I've been talking about technology for 10 minutes, and now I'm just hoping it works. OK, I'm sending the message. Let's see if it does what it That looks promising. Phew, that's nice. <laughs> OK, join me as we count down from five to one. Five, four, three, two, one. Our site is live. Thank you. Go to the forum. Leave your comments. Thank you.